get somewhere in between. The title of my message this morning is Ways to Praise. We're going to take our text from the book of Psalms, the 22nd chapter, the third verse. Just one verse. It reads like this. But thou art holy, O thou that inhabitest the praises of Israel. Let's read it again. But thou art holy, O thou that inhabitest the praises of Israel. This verse tells us that when we praise him, we build a place for him to live. Father in heaven, I thank you this morning for the privilege I have of being here with your people on this day to worship you. Lord, I ask that you give me the words that I need to say, that the message might reach us. In your name I pray, amen. As I was sitting back there, I got to thinking about what I'm going to be preaching on this morning, and I thought to myself, isn't it wonderful how the Lord makes things so appropriate? The day that the world is praising uh, ungodly stuff, we are in the house of God to praise him, and we get to hear what he says in his words about the importance of praising the Lord. We... You know, God wants to live among his people. And when we read this verse, we find out that God wants to live so closely and so intimately to us that our praise is where he wants to live. There was, there, there's another title to this message. Uh, when I first began to preach it, I called it Power and Praise. Because there is power. If we build a place for him to live in our praise, and he is omnipotent, that means all authority, all power, all ability belongs to him. And if he is that way, and he lives in our praise, that means when we begin to praise him, we tap into the, the power of God, literally. We tap into the power of God by our praise. And as I was preparing for this message, I began to consider the fact if, if this is such an important concept that we are to praise God, surely the word must have a lot to say about praise. And I discovered something. And I don't plan to get to all of them, but I, I did discover something. I discovered that there are over 15 words in the Hebrew and the Greek that are translated into the English with the word praise. And each one of these 15 words have a different emphasis. And uh, I'm hoping this morning that I can let us leave here this morning aware that any of us can praise God, and we don't all have to do it the same way. That's, a, a, that's an unusual concept to some folks because I know folks that will tell you if you don't praise the way they praise, you aren't praising. If you don't shout the way they shout, you aren't spiritual. But as I look at the Word of God, I find that's just not the case. The case is that he has included all kinds of words all kinds of applications to the concept of praise for you and I. And what I, hey, just in case you think that I, I'm afraid of you praising the Lord while I preach, I've been in the church of God for 66 years. That's a long time. Why well, no, 67 years. So I've heard, heard it just about every way it can be heard. You aren't going to disturb me any of it in any way whatsoever if one of these words we talk about this morning strikes your fancy and you just want to praise God that way, you go ahead. And if too many people get excited and start praising, we'll wait till you finish. And then we'll finish. There are ways we can praise God that many of us 
have not even considered. I'm just waiting to the day I can find that word somewhere that means I can whistle in church. Even if I can't carry a tune. You know, hey, I was raised up in southeast Georgia and just a, a little bit north of here in a little community called Juanita, Florida. And um, I was taught that whistling was a happy sound. And if I'm supposed to be praising God, which I'm going to find out that's a joyful sound, then maybe I could whistle. I think it would be appropriate. I don't think there'd be a thing wrong with it if somebody were to break out in a, a song whistling to give praise unto the Lord. Now, I've already said that he lives in our prayers. He is omnipotent. We tap into his power. So there is power in our praise. We, I hope you understand what I'm trying to say. When we praise him, it's a powerful thing. And we have access to his power through our praise of him. Now, there are certain words that are translated praise that are only found in one of the Testaments, either the New Testament or the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, I have selected five different words to talk about this morning. And then there's two in the New Testament. You won't find these anywhere else except the Old Testament for five of them, the New Testament, two of them. But then there's some words that are found in each one of the Testaments or similar in both of them. And we're going to talk about those too. First of all, I want us to realize that in Psalms chapter 9 and verse 1, there is a word translated praise in that verse that has the idea of praising him with an extended hand, with an outstretched hand, as in the act of throwing something. And I thought about that. I wondered about that. And then I remembered that over in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 7, he says, we can cast all our care upon him, for he cares for us. And I got to thinking, hey, if I, if I look at Psalms and it says, I worship with an outstretched hand like I was throwing something, and Peter says, I can cast all my care upon him. That means when I go to him in prayer and I take my needs, I take my wants, I take my uh, situation that I am, and I say, Lord, it's yours. Guess what I've done? I've praised him. It wasn't just a selfish act or a selfish act at all. It was not a greedy act. I'm praising the Lord. And I thought, why? How can me giving my needs to him be praised? And then I realized what it's saying is, Lord, I trust you. I trust you to take care of what I can't take care of. I trust you to intervene where I can't intervene. Lord, I trust you with my children. I trust you with my needs. God, I just trust you, so I'm giving it all to you. And can I tell you that's some of the hardest things for us to do. That's probably one of the hardest acts of Praise that we can perform when we give it all to him because we like to think we can fix it. Hey, uh, when I lived in southeastern Georgia, my dad was a sharecropper. And when you're a sharecropper, if anything goes wrong, you got to fix it because you can't afford to fight, hire anybody else to do it. But there are some things you can't fix. I found out in my life, there are some things I can't fix, but I know the fixer. And I'm, I, I'm engaged in an act of praise when I throw my needs upon him, for he cares for us. And then in Psalms 117, the, both verses of Psalms 117 talk about praise. It uses two different words. In the second chapter, or second verse of Psalms 117, it uses a word that means to praise him loudly. Get noisy. Get loud in your praise of him. Hey, we Pentecostals like that, don't we? Because uh, I, I found out over the years that one thing that makes a Pentecostal preacher nervous is when folks get tired or get quiet. Makes us nervous. We aren't doing what we're supposed to be doing. After all, we probably received the instruction somewhere down the line to shout make, or preach them happy. So we get nervous, but... We like the fact we can praise him loudly. Now, some of the more sedate churches don't like that either, but that's okay. It's scriptural. Be loud in your praise. 
Nothing wrong with being loud. But then the next verse, it has a word that is translated praise. It means to rave about him. Brag about him. Let me give you an idea of what I mean. Walk up to a grandparent. And if you aren't careful, they'll pull out a whole long folder full of pictures about their grandkids. They'll tell you their grandkids are the smartest, the most good looking, and the best in the whole world. They would have raved. If, if one of them got up and lost a tooth, they're going to tell you about that tooth they just lost. They rave about their grandkids. That's the way we ought to be in our praise to him. When's the last time you really bragged about him to somebody? Told him how wonderful the Lord is. Told them how great it is to serve him. We can brag about him. And it's all founded on truth. Because we can never tell the true measure of his greatness of his love, of his mercy, of his tenderness. You know, there are two words that we use when we talk about salvation that are so important. We talk about mercy and grace. We can never overplay those words as we talk about him and we praise him. Let me just give you my definition of them. Mercy, that's when God doesn't give me what I deserve. Grace is when he does give me what I don't deserve. And we can not tell about them and make them exaggerated because there's no exaggeration to them. We praise him. We rave about him. We tell how wonderful he is. Then in Judges, the uh, fifth chapter in the second verse, there's a word that's translated praise and it means to adore him. Hey, have you ever seen a teenage couple or a newlywed older couple and watch how they looked at one another? You know, like the, the child said to somebody, said, uh, I think it was an older sibling, said to them, said, he loves you. And they said, how do you know? He said, because the way they look at you. And then they said, no, it's, it's more than that. It's the way they look at you when you look at them. Watch a young couple in love, especially their first love. You can see adoration. Or look at a mother when they put that newborn babe in her arms. She just went through some of the most intense pain a human, man, a human person can suffer. But when she looks at that, first thing she does is make sure she's got 10 toes and 10 fingers. And then she looks at that little baby. She just gave life to. And she, the look on her face is a look of adoration. That's how we need to be in God. That's how our praise of God to be. We look at him with adoration, intense love that nothing can take its place. It's worth everything we've had to go through. So we adore him. And the Bible says that we praise him with adoration. Then I found another verse. Now, I'm glad I found it. You see, I grew up in a church where the only time you clapped hand in church is when keeping time with the music. That's fine if you can keep time. But you see, I can't keep time. When I was having to march in the Navy, I always found myself about a tenth of a step behind everybody else. Or maybe I was nine tenths of a step ahead of them. I forget which it was. But anyway, I was never on time. I was always having to skip to make up, get my steps in synchronization again. So I can't keep time. But I found in Psalms chapter 47 verse 1 that we are to clap our hands in praise. Jeremiah the 33rd chapter gives a, a similar idea. We are to clap our hands in praise. 
And then I began to think, this is a way that the world measures the effect, if efficiency of somebody's speech. They clap their hands. In fact, I guess they got somebody appointed to, to count in time, let a president give a speech, and they will almost always tell you how many standing ovations they received. In fact, they can even tell you how long most of them lasted. And I thought, when was the last time that without prompting, we stood and gave God a standing ovation, clapped our heads as we thanked him, as we praised him for how wonderful he is. Oh, yes, give him applause. Give him praise. We can all do that. It, you know, we don't have to do it in the same, oh, hallelujah. Yes, praise him, worship him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. We give him praise. We, uh, we applaud him. And you know that's something you can do with yourself or with a crowd. So we praise him with the clapping of our hands. Then I go over into the New Testament and I find in Luke the 18th chapter, the 43rd verse, there's a word translated praise there that literally means tell stories. The 18th chapter of Luke tells about Bartimaeus and how that he was given his sight and then he began to tell the story. We all have stories. We just call them testimonies. And, and you know, you try to talk to somebody and you try to share the word with you, they can try to find fault with the word, but hey, they can't do a thing about your story because it's your story. You haven't borrowed it from somebody else. You were there when it happened. So you really ought to know. We share our stories and it's praising him. Oh, we praise him with our stories, with our testimonies, because we talk about what he has done for us. And, it, you know, I love testimony services. But I've seen a few of them where I wished I could tell somebody to kind of cut it off. Because about halfway through, it seemed almost like they were giving praise to the devil for how much he had harassed them. If you gotta talk about what the devil's done to you somewhere in that story, be sure you say, but the Lord delivered me out of all of them. Give the praise to him. That's what our stories are all about. And we praise him with our stories. Then I like this one. First Peter, the fourth chapter, the 11th verse. It tells us that we can praise him with dignity. Now, I said, I told you that in Psalms it said we could praise him loudly. Peter says we can do it quietly. Now, I know that's contrary to how some people want to believe it, but it's true anyway. We can praise him with dignity. Let me give you an idea of what I mean. When I was pastoring the first church that I pastored in Virginia, and before then I had met this gentleman I made friends with a man by the name of Frank Lemons. 
Now, Frank Lemons had a brother named David. David was excitable. He was also a preacher. He was one of those that were excitable. Brother Frank told me one time he and David kind of did what brothers do sometimes. And David looked at him and said, Frank, I think you could preach standing on a brick. Brother Frank said, I paused for a minute and I looked at him and said, I could. I've heard this man preach the word of God. I've never heard him get excited. I never heard him raise his voice above the level that was necessary to communicate. But I want to tell you something. When David or when Frank Lemon stepped out of the pulpit, you knew you had heard the word of God. We called him in Virginia the gentleman preacher. Very dignified man. Oh, but he praised God in his dignity. He praised God without getting excited. He, he just wasn't an excitable person. And some folks just are not excitable. I remember when my son played Little League Baseball. And I would go to his games. My wife would get excited. She'd do what mothers do. I'd do this. Good job, son. That was my excitement. So I tell people, when you see me say, do this, I just shouted. Because that's just the way some of us are. And for, for too long, some people have made us feel insufficient and unspiritual because that's the way we are. But I found out when I, oh, when I found what Peter said and I really began to look at it, I found out that if I'm loud, if I'm excitable, I can praise him loudly. But if I'm not excitable, I can still praise him. Just don't get loud with it. But I still praise to him. In Leviticus chapter 19, verse 24, we find another word translated praise, and it's connected with an offering. And it's a word that means to do it in celebration. We praise him in celebration. We celebrate while we praise him. Praising him should not be a chore. It should not be something that we feel like somebody's got to be a cheerleader and drag it out of us. Praising him should be a celebration, a party if you would. We praise him. We celebrate in our praise of him. Psalms 101 says it's praise that gets us into the gates. We enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Again, let me go back to my experience on the farm. We had a fence around our house. There was a gate in the fence. We had a front porch on the house. There was a door just off the, you weren't in a house when you got on the porch, there was a door you had to go through with. So Thanksgiving gets us through the gate. Praise gets us on the front porch, ready to go into the house. We we enter into his courts with thanksgiving and into his gates, or enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Your praise literally brings you into the presence of God. As you praise him, you enter his presence. And I just thought about this. It's not in my notes, but let me just throw it in here. Did you know that prayers will get you, or praise will get you into his presence, but nothing else will. When you've prayed and you think the heavens are made of brass, that your prayers may reach the ceiling and they may not, if you can just find a place, private or public, and just begin to praise him. It won't be long until you're in his presence as you Praise him. Praising him will bring you there when prayer doesn't. Praising him will bring you there when preaching doesn't. You bring your praise and it brings you into the presence of the Lord. Philippians chapter 4 verse 4 uses a word that is similar to celebration and it says rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say Rejoice. 
In other words, praise him when it's convenient. Praise him when it's not. Praise him when it's popular. Praise him when it's unpopular. You just praise the Lord and don't worry about what anybody else does. Don't even worry about whether they're praising or not. And if they are praising, don't worry about how they're doing it. After you all, the concentration, the center is on him. We're praising him. And it doesn't matter how somebody else praises them. You can praise him quietly while everybody else is praising him loudly. Praise him in celebration. Now, praise in celebration sometimes is a sacrifice. Now, I know that sounds strange. We're having a party, but there's going to be a sacrifice involved. Yes. In fact, in Hebrews, the 13th chapter, the 15th verse, and in Leviticus, the 7th chapter, verses 11 through 13, it talks about the sacrifice of praise. Praise is not always easy. Sometimes we have to go against ourself, our, our feelings, if you would, and praise him anyway. There is nothing that says anywhere in the book that everything's going to always be easy. I wish I could tell folks that when you get saved, your problems are all over with. A lot of times you get saved and your problems are just starting because the devil doesn't like you like it when you leave his camp. He'll make it hard for you if he possibly can. And sometimes he uses good people to make it hard for you. But praise him anyway, even if it is a sacrifice of praise. You see, Leviticus talks about the sacrifice of thanksgiving, and it describes it. And it describes the fact that sometimes after three years, the fourth year, you was to be used as a sacrifice of thanksgiving. Every ear of corn you put up on that fourth year was not yours. It was to be thanksgiving, a blessing unto God. And when you did, guess what he did? He made third year last to the fifth year. That's what he promised. And we need to understand that although it may cost us, we can still praise him. Then we are to praise him with laudation according to 1 Chronicles chapter 16 and verse 4. That means boast, boast. That's another, you know, it's a little bit different from bragging. It's boasting about him. We are to boast about the Lord. In fact, it is a generational thing. In Psalms Chapter 79 and verse 13 and chapter one or chapter 145 and verse 4, we find that one generation is to talk about him to the next generation. The old ones tell the young ones about what it means to serve the Lord, about how great and how wonderful and what amazing a thing it is to be one of his. And then the younger generation turn around and tell the same thing to the older generation. It crosses generational lines as we worship him and we talk about his goodness and his greatness and his mercy and his grace and all of the other things from generation to generation. That's why, hey, when I pastored, I had children's church. I love children's church. In fact, when I was a youth pastor in Dumfries, Virginia, I had 40 kids between the ages of 4 and 12. Part of the time, all by myself. We had a time. Sometimes we had to carry them up the stairs to their parents, but we had a time, and sometimes questions got to be, got to be asked that you had trouble answering, but you had to be careful how you answered it because they weren't looking for a lot of the things you thought they were looking for. I love children's church, but I think every once in a while, children ought to sit in here, and they ought to see grown-ups praising the Lord. Don't sit in here and see grown-ups frowning at them if they wiggle a little bit, but let them see grown-ups 
praising the Lord. Generation to generation. According to Philippians chapter 1 and verse 11, it's all because of him. It's all because of him. Now I, as you have probably guessed by cause of my age and where I was raised up, country gospel, or southern gospel they call it now, is my favorite kind of gospel. I love four-part harmony. I can't harmonize, but I love to hear it. I know it when I hear it, and I love it. But you know there are some of the modern songs that have a message that us older folks need to consider. I remember the first time I heard a song, and I can't recall the title of it, but it says, forgive me, Lord, for the things that I've made it. And it's all about you. I'm going back to the heart of worship because it's all about you. I love that song. It's all about him. It's not what we want. It's not what makes us feel good. It's what praises him. It's what raises him. It's, it's what brags about him. That's what it's all about when we come together. And I love coming together with God's people. Isn't it good to know that we're getting to where we can come together and worship without somebody trying to keep us away? We're going to make it all the way one of these days. It's going to be a wonderful time. Lastly, on the words about praise, Psalms 150, verses 3 through 5, I find that we are to praise him with music. Praise him with music. Psalms 157, verse tells, 7 tells it with our heart. He said, my heart is fixed, O Lord. That means it's established. That means it's sitting there, and, and our, our purpose is to praise him, praise him, because our heart is settled on that. But that word fixed also means, as we know here in the South, that word fixed also means to repair. You know, that was part of the ministry of Christ. He said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, the giving of sight to the blind, the setting at liberty, those that are bound, and I know I'm messing up the quote, you know what I'm talking about. And also it says, to heal the broken heart. Our hearts may be broken. From our heart, we can praise him, even in our brokenness. And as we praise him, we build a place for him to live. And this praise with music can be public. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 12, Psalms chapter 22, verse 22, it says, in the congregation will I praise him. In the congregation will I praise him. That means we can praise him when we come to church. And it's all right for us to praise. We ought to walk on the, on, on the grounds. We pull our car up instead of fussing at the one that just cut us out of our parking place, we ought to step out of our car praising the Lord. I'm not telling you it's easy. I know how hard it is. Been there, done that. But we can do it. We can praise him. We can enter this place praising him in public. But understand that our public praise is fed by our private praise. We can praise him in private. Praise him in our hearts, Colossians says. That means I can drive down the highway and I can praise him. I can go to the shower and while I'm getting the sweat off my body, I can praise him. I can praise him in the prophecy of my bedroom or my living room. I can turn the TV off and praise the Lord. I can have the TV on and praise him. We can praise him in private. In fact, we must. Now, understand, praising him in music, there's various styles. Some folks like them slow. Some folks like them fast. Some folks like them with melodic music. And some of the music, I'm not so, so sure that it's melodious. 
But nevertheless, we can praise him each style of music as long as it's praising him is acceptable. And then we can praise him with a new song. Psalms chapter 33, verse 3, chapter 40, verse 3, says you put a new song in my mouth. You put a new song in my heart. We can praise him with new songs. And I think we ought to. After all, there was a time when amazing grace was a new song. In fact, some of the hymns that we like so much as we sing them, when they first came out, the church leaders didn't want them sung in their church. Just think about that and I'll let it go. Praise him with a new song because now I want to get to where I was leading to. What happens when God's people begin to praise him? What happens as we build him a place to reign? Three things that I want to share, and I'm sure you can find many more. In Joshua, the sixth chapter, the story of the walls of Jericho. Walls come down when God's people praise him. Go and read the story. It wasn't the loud voices that caused the walls to come. It wasn't even the loud trumpets. For you see, for 12 times, they marched around that wall with the trumpets blowing, not a single brick fell. But when the people of God, in obedience to the command of God, turned toward the wall and they shouted, and according to my strong concordance, that word shout has the same connotation as a joyful noise. And I have found in Scripture that a joyful noise can be praise unto him. So they praised him. I think it was a shout of, it wasn't a war cry. I think it was a shout of praise. And as they praised him, the walls of Jericho came down. I got to thinking about that. And I thought about the fact we have built walls that separate us by age, by gender, by personality types, by national origin. We have built walls, and I'm talking about in the church. I'm not talking about just in the world. In the church, we have erected walls that separate us. It's time that we as the people of God Begin to praise him in unity. Even if we have to do it in several different languages at the same time. After all, he made the languages. He can understand them. They can, they can be all mixed up and he can still understand them. And we praise him together. And as we praise him together, I am persuaded that the walls that have been erected, that have separated us, will come down as we praise him in unity. The walls come down when God's people praise him. But that's not all. In Second Chronicles, the 20th chapter, I find that wars are won, battles are won when people praise him. It's a story of a time that a coalition came against Israel, or actually Judah, and they got all scared, and they went to the priests and the prophet, and they found out that the battle wasn't theirs, it was the Lord's, and that they were to go out the next morning, and victory was going to come, and they were even told how to arrange the battle. Now, I don't know about you, but I know enough about battles to know that if I'm going to go into a battle, I'm going to have my most efficient force out front. If I'm in the army, I want my biggest tanks. If I'm in the Air Force, I want my fastest planes. If I'm in the Navy, I want my biggest ships or quietest submarines out front. But go and read that 20th chapter of Second Chronicles and you'll find out they put the singers out front 
and they told them to praise the Lord. They're going into battle. A coalition is against them. They are outnumbered. But they began to praise the Lord as they marched. And when they got there, they didn't even have to draw their sword. They didn't even have to put their shield in place because the battle had already been won. The enemy had killed one another. All they had to do was go in and gather the spoils. Took them several days to haul it all off the battlefield. But they went into battle praising. And in their praise, the battle was won. In the coming days, we may see battles. We may, we may even in our country see a point that it becomes illegal to be a Christian. We may see it. I hope not, but we might. But I'm here to tell you, church, if we do, we can walk into the battle praising him. We don't have to walk into battle calling the enemy names. We just walk in giving praise. And as we praise, the victory will be won. I'm here to tell you two things that I found out from the book. Number one, this earth is going to stand for at least another thousand and seven years. And man's not going to destroy it. God is but only after the millennium. The other thing is to tell you I've read the end of the book and I have found out we win. Yes, just keep praising him and we win. So praise him for battles are won. And the third thing that happens when God's people begin to praise him is found in the 16th chapter of Acts, verses 25 through 34, the story of Paul and Silas in the Philippian jail. And at midnight, after they had been beaten, arrested unfairly, tied up with chains, fetters, carried down not just into the outer courts of the prison, but all the way down into to the central dungeon, and there they were tied, they were locked up, they had their feet in stocks, and about midnight, they began to sing and to praise God. And as they praised him, the jailhouse shook. The doors were open. The stocks fell off. The chains fell off. And Paul got to preach to the jailer and win the whole family to the Lord. Freedom was given when they praised him. I want us to understand this morning that as we begin to build a place for him to live with our praises, as we praise him, we're going to find freedom that we have never thought about before. We're going to be able to praise him more and more effectively. We will even be able to approach people that it didn't seem like we could approach him. As we praise the Lord, there is power in praise. And God has ensured that every one of us can praise him. I've just shared with you 15 words from scripture that shows that each one of us can praise him however we feel comfortable in praising him. We can praise him regardless of what others are doing. We don't have to praise according to the tradition. We don't have to praise because of anything except our relationship with him. We praise the Lord, and no one is left out. You know, I, I listen to people play the guitar, and I've heard them, some of them that can make those guitars do just about anything except stand up and beg. In fact, I heard a guy one time playing a Hawaiian steel guitar, and he played Listen to the Mockingbird on it, and you could hear the birds whistle. I had a guitar for five years. I knew where my left hand was supposed to go. I knew where my right hand was supposed to go, but I guess couldn't get them to go there at the same time. In fact, the only thing I ever got out of that guitar was a sore finger, and I still got the, short, the scar on my finger to show. 
Do you know what? I don't have to play the guitar to praise him. I can praise him in the way he's given me to be able to praise him. None of us are left out. But I want you to notice one thing about the three stories I shared at the end of the message. The praise came before the event. Israel praised him before the walls fell. Judah praised him before the battle was run, won. Paul and Silas praised him before the jail was opened. Maybe we ought to praise him and see what happens to the things. They might turn out not to be what we thought they were. They may just disappear as we praise him. Praise is something that only those who know him can really engage in. Oh, we might be able to say the words. The, the person that does to know him might even be able to copy the actions. But real praise can only come from those who know him and only those who turn to him can know him. One final thing I want to share with you and then I'm going to give you a chance to do something. Child of God, are you tired of the devil kicking you around? Are you tired coming off second best every fight we have with him praise him just praise him when I was a youngster I remember collecting comic books some of you maybe can remember this I believe it was Marvel Comics might have been one of the others but on the back of the comic book just about every one of them had an advertisement for Charles Atlas. And there was always this 90-pound weekly that got sand kicked in his face all the time until he took Charles Atlas's course. And then he took charge. We don't need Charles Atlas's course. If we're tired of being a pushover for the devil, all we have to do is begin to praise the Lord. And as we praise him, he gives us power to overcome. And it's all keyed to praise. I've shared with us 15 ways to praise the Lord. And I've shared the fact that there is power in our praise. I don't know, I don't know you. This is the first time I've ever been in this particular church. I've known about it for a while. Found out today that Brother, Charles, or Brother Jim Brewer pastored here for 36 years, and I've known Brother James for a while. So I don't know you. I'm going to ask you a very serious question. Do you know him? You cannot praise him until you know him. Do you know the Lord? Have you asked for the forgiveness of your sin? You say, but I haven't done anything bad. I didn't ask you that. I asked you whether you had accepted Christ as your Savior. Hey, I got saved when I was 11 years old. You tell me what an 11-year-old boy can do, and I'll tell you some of the things you don't even know about. I remember he forgave me. Many, many years ago, he forgave me. He can forgive you. You may have kept it a secret from anybody that you haven't accepted Christ, but it's time to come clean with him. Admit that you're a sinner. Accept him. I want every head bowed for a few minutes. I don't know if there's anybody that could get to the piano or the music, but that, that's okay. Every head bowed. I want to ask you, do you know him?
I was going to do it a different way, but this is the way I'm going to do it. Do you know Christ as your Savior? If you do, would you raise your hand? You know Christ as your Savior. Would you raise your hand? 